Good morning. Welcome to the Battles Within. We're continuing our study entitled, Who is Jesus? Uh, today we're going to be covering uh, the, uh, the, the discourse that Jesus had on um, that he's the bread, he's the bread and the water, the life, the blood. Um, and so we're going to begin that message. Remember last week's lesson, we, um, in last week's lesson, we were covering Jesus walking on the water. And we remember we also covered that Peter walked on the water. And then remember, once they got to the shore, they departed to the other side. I mean, they were instantly there. Once Jesus got in the boat, they were instantly there. So again, another miracle. <clears throat> I apologize for my voice. I got a little horse this weather back and forth. <laughs> Uh, today, though, we're in John chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 22 through 35. I'm not sure we'll get it all covered today, but that's our intent. <clears throat> so let's look at verse 22. Uh, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity we have that we can worship you, we can come to your word, we can see about you, we can learn more of who Jesus is. So I pray right now you help us, Lord, as we go forward that we can understand. Pray for my voice that you would help me. Keep it going to get to what I need to say. For in the mighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so again, like I said, today we're going to begin the message on Jesus with the water, a uh, message of the bread and the wine. Look at verse 22 of John chapter 6. Verse 22 of John chapter 6. It says, The day following, when the people stood on the other side of the sea, that saw there was none other boat there, save the one whereinto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but the disciples were gone along. So it says the day following. You remember, again, the multitude had seen the great miracles, you know, the feeding of the 5,000, that many wanted to make Jesus king, even by force. And so Jesus had sent them away after he sent his disciples away, and they saw that. They saw he sent his disciples away and then sent them away. So they wondered, what, where was he at? Now, during the time period that uh, they saw him go away to the time he, uh, they, they wondered where he was at, uh, the disciples had been in distress in the sea. Jesus walked on the water. Peter walked on the water. And then there's miraculously instantly to the other side. So the people gathered to see Jesus again, but he was gone. They assumed the disciples were gone, but he was there because there's no other boat left, so he had to be there. When they looked for him, they couldn't find him. It says, when the people were still on the side of the sea, that means they were on the side where Jesus had just come from. The, they were on Bethesda's side. Jesus and his disciples were now back in Capernaum. And it says, after Jesus had dismissed them, that they stood all night waiting for the boat to come back over. They're waiting for the boats. That's why they were sitting there on the shore waiting for the boat. There probably a storm came up. And they said, sit on the shore waiting for the boats because there's no boats. So they knew Jesus was on this side just like them. They didn't know way to get over. Now, it's possible that many, knowing that Jesus had not gone to his disciples, stayed hoping to meet with him in the morning and see more miracles. It says here in John, it says, They saw that there was none other boat there, save the one wherein his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with the disciples into the boat, but the disciples were gone away alone. So they saw there was only one boat had left that evening, and it was, had the disciples on it, not him. No other boat had left, therefore Jesus should still be on that side of the sea. Verse 23, how, and this is in parentheses, that's added by John, how be it there came other boats from Tiberias nigh to the place where they did eat bread after the Lord had given thanks. And it says, after disciples had departed, other boats had arrived on the shore where they were at, but none appeared to have departed that night, save the boat in which the disciples were on. It said they came from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread. The town stood on the western border of the lake, not far from where the miracles had been performed. And after the Lord had given thanks, this cause was given, this clause was added to show that the multiplication of the food. So remember the verse, how be it that the folks came Tiberius down to the place where they didn't eat bread, after the Lord had given thanks. So again, after the Lord had given thanks is a, is a reflection on the miracle that he had performed. Because once Jesus gave thanks, remember he gave everybody bread and they fed over 5,000 people. 5,000 men, we don't know how many women and children there were, so it was clearly more than 5,000. Verse 24, when the disciples therefore saw that Jesus was not there, with well, the people, that is, therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. So he's not here. What happened to him? He's not here. How did he get over there? 
So they got in boats and they traveled over to Capernaum. Um, and so they also took shipping. They took passage on these ships that came in the night before. Remember, they came from Tiberias. Uh, and they go to Capernaum looking to see Jesus. And remember, Capernaum is where Jesus' headquarters was at. Verse 25. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? So when they got there, they went to Capernaum in the synagogue, it says. Well, we know they're in the synagogue because in verse 59 that we'll get to it later on, it says these things he said in the synagogue as he taught in the Capernaum. So when they got there, they couldn't find him. They looked for him and all. And, and then on the Sabbath day when he was in the synagogue, they found him. And so they asked him about this event. And they said unto him, Rabbi, Master, which is a name used by most people that refer to someone who's knowledgeable, a Jewish doctor, you know. Uh, now, Jesus appreciated them calling him that. He didn't want to call him king, but he didn't mind them calling him rabbi. Uh, John thirteen thirteen, he says, you call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. So he doesn't mind them calling him master and Lord because that's who he is. But he's not the king that they're talking about when they want to make him king. They want to make him earthly king, and that was not his calling. At least not at that time. The miracles convinced these men that Jesus was uh, the prophet that should come, and they honored him with this title. And then they asked him that question, When comest thou hither? Now, since Jesus didn't go with his disciples, there was no other boats that went off the night before. How did he get there? These folks had come over the first thing in the morning, and Jesus wasn't with them, so they were amazed to see him and wondered where and how he got there. Verse 26, and Jesus answered them and said, now he did not directly answer the question, but could easily have done so. I mean, he walked on the water. He found his disciples in great distress. He delivered them, instantly transported them to the shore. That's what happened. That's how he got to the other side of the shore. But Jesus not willing to gratify their curiosity. You know, this group was one that wanted to make him king. They didn't need any added information to justify their actions. So Jesus knew their thoughts and what their motives were for asking. So Jesus turns his focus to them and not to him. Jesus did that often, did he not? He turned his focus away from the, the, the question on him to the question on them. I mean, he knew their principles. He knew why they sought after him and followed him. Jesus wanted them to know who he, he wanted to know that he knew them. He knew who they were. They did not know who Jesus was, but Jesus knew who they were. Jesus is a searcher of hearts. He desires to reprove them. So he addressed them that way. He says, verily, verily, I'm saying to you, truly, truly, he says, um, full well knowledge to Christ, what their own conscience were attesting. He knew what they thought. He knew why they asked what they asked. He said, you seek me not. You seek me not because you saw the miracles. He said, you're not seeking me for those reasons. You're not seeking me because I fed so large a crowd with such a small quantity, healing them if it needed it. Not because you believe me to be king promised by the prophets. That's not why you're seeking me. You don't seek me for the real reasons or the right reasons, he said. He goes on and says, but ye seek, ye did eat the loaves and were filled. They regarded their own bellies more than the honor and glory of Christ. Their view being that their own worldly advantages, not the spiritual or everlasting good of the soul. They wanted what they could get now. They saw Jesus as, a, as, a, as something they could achieve of their own personal desires. Now, some desire to have an earthly king that would defeat Rome, you know, give them prosperity, all their stuff back as a nation again. Some of them just want to be fed. They weren't really interested in a redeemer. Verse 27. <clears throat> Labor not, Jesus says. Now, this doesn't mean that they shouldn't work. I mean, that's not at all. Uh, first, Thess uh, Second Thessalonians 3.10 says, For even when you were with, even when, we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. That's from Paul. So the Bible clearly teaches you should work, or if you're going to eat, you need to work. So that's not what he means by labor not. What it means, we're not to make work our primary focus. Matthew 6.25 says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, 
nor yet for your bodies what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body more than remnant. See, it's more important. There's things, spiritual things are far more important than carnal things. He said, for the meat which perish, don't, don't labor for the meat that perisheth. The food that meets your natural needs perish. The strength you gain from it is soon exhausted, and you got to eat again. Uh, it's constantly having to recharge your body. He said, but eat, but, but you need to be searching for the meat that endures, the spiritual meat. That which supplies your spiritual wants. The spiritual meats support, nourishes, and strengthens your soul. Those things are eternal. He says, unto everlasting life. See, the strength derived from the doctrine of the gospel is not exhausted. It endures without wasting away. It nourishes the soul to everlasting life. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. See, this is what he wanted them to have. He wanted them to understand it's not the meat that you eat today. Uh, we had an event last night at our church for my daughter, who was 18, just turned 18 on the uh, uh, this past week, and she's graduating from high school, so we had a graduation 18th birthday party for her. And the food was outstanding. I mean, my friend Kelvin Hunkett cooked the chickens, and it was, I mean, it was, you couldn't ask for anything better. But you know what? <laughs> that food's gone this morning. <laughs> As great as it was, it's gone, and we have to look for something else to eat, don't we? See, food that you eat today, those things that you get in this carnal life, they don't last. The money you make is soon spent. The joys you have are soon passed. Those don't last. But things that you get from God, the spiritual things you get from God, they endure, he says, unto everlasting life. He said, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. Two meanings. Everlasting life, which is in the Son, and is accessible to all who receive him. You can get eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Only through him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. No man come to the Father but by me. Only through Jesus Christ, only through trusting in him can you have eternal life. But Jesus says, I can give you this eternal life. I can give you this eternal bread. The meat which endures into eternal life is to be labored for. Not by preparing it or purchasing it, but by asking for it in prayer. By keeping the ordinances of the gospel, by exercising faith in Christ, this is how you this is how you keep the 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 meat that lasts forever. He says, For him hath God the Father sealed. I mean to seal is to confirm. It's kind of like a notary public puts a stamp on it. Approval. So the Father, by the miracles which Jesus performed, and God the Father had shown that he had sent him, approved his doctrines, and ratified his works. By performing the miracles that Jesus performed, it was a stamp of approval. It justified, it proved that God was in favor, for only through God's power could Jesus Christ do those things. Well, God is Christ, is Jesus. But remember, he submitted himself to the, 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 the human body and the conditions of the human body. The miracles were to Jesus' doctrines was a seal is written in John 3.33. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. See, the miracles that Jesus performed was a stamp of approval. <coughs> Excuse me, a stamp of approval that God supported Jesus. That Jesus was doing what he was supposed to be doing. Verse 28, Then said they unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? So now, have you heard what Jesus said? And somewhat understanding the kind of the jest of his meaning, they understood that they must labor and work not for perishing foods, but for durable foods, as they imagined, in order to obtain eternal life by working. So they said, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? This works mindset did not have an issue with being required to work. They they were they always believed in work. They were legalists. Tell me what I need to do to have eternal life. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? See, like what can it's you it's a work salvation. 
They know they wanted to know what other works they needed to do beyond Moses' described, beyond what Moses described, the, the, the Ten Commandments, following those, perhaps those that the Pharisees had required even being done. They suggest that they would gladly do whatever, what action, what action do you need me to take? I mean, kind of the general view and conviction on how to obtain eternal life. They, they were seeking for righteousness and life not by faith, but by works of the law. That's how they wanted to be saved. Many people today stumble over that too. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I'm about to put a cough drop in. I don't normally do that, but this this sinus cold I have is really bothering me. So you have to bear with me. I apologize, but it is what it is. So, uh, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the works of God, that ye believe on him who has sent. The only work of God you need to do is to have faith. Some people say, well, faith is not a work because you can't be saved. You can't be saved by works. I would argue that I think you've got a poor definition of works. You don't earn your salvation in any way. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He paid it all. He made it, he enabled you to be saved. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and allows your wretched soul that has no hope, never seeking after God, the Bible says, gives you the ability to choose. The only way you have the ability to choose is because the Holy Spirit enables you to have that ability. Because by yourself, you can do nothing. So the Holy Spirit comes upon you and gives you the ability to choose. At that point in time, you must choose. Choose to accept or choose to reject, but you must choose. Now, is the choosing a work? Some would say yes, some would say no. But in the end, it's still something you must do. So to be saved, there is something you must do. You must have faith. You must have faith. You must choose to have faith. Choose to accept, choose to reject, but you must choose. And the choosing of that, is that a work? You know, I think it's semantics. Bottom line is, there's something you must do. To be saved, you must, you must accept Jesus Christ as your first Savior. You must believe it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, verse 30. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee that thou doest works? What, do, what dost thou work? So now having heard, the only thing that they could do was believe in him as being the one that sent for the Father. They then asked him for a sign to prove that he was sent for the Father. Okay, I have to believe you were sent for the Father? Then give me a sign. Now, they just witnessed the miracles of the feeding of 5,000, among other miracles, that were asking for more proof, more evidence, so they might believe in him, believe that he's the one. I mean, so they said this. Here's their recommendation. Look, our fathers did eat manna in heaven, in the desert, and it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, but the Messiah was to be greater than Moses. Even though Jesus had extended the use of the small human-related materials to feeding 5,000 people, this crowd believed Jesus' sign was less than that of Moses because he Moses brought, they said, Moses gave us manna from nowhere. You took something you already had and multiplied it. So it's not quite as big as taking nothing and making something. You took something and made something else with it. So therefore, a greater thing than Moses would be if you didn't. Now, understand, there's a problem here. <laughs> We'll get to it in a minute with their thinking. Have what I called stinking thinking. They believed the Messiah was to be was to cause manna again to fall from heaven as their rabbis taught. The food they had eaten, it miraculously multiplied, was still food of the earth, common bread, common relish. Their fathers had eaten manna, which came directly from God. The psalmist had told the Hebrew children loved to chant, Bread from heaven was that which he gave them to eat. So if Moses brought the bread from heaven down and he is greater than Moses, then we should see greater things than these. Not just taking food, earthly food, and multiplying it, but bringing down heavenly food. 
And Jesus has a, has a retort for them. Verse 32. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. <laughs> your first, he said your first inclination is wrong. First of all, Moses didn't give you anything. Moses didn't give you anything. Moses didn't give you manna from heaven. Moses didn't do anything. He said, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Uh, neither was the manna bread from heaven, though it was so called by the psalmist, an account of the only thing typifies it, for it dropped from the air only. It didn't come from heaven. It came out of the air. Uh, he said, but my father giveth you true bread from heaven. It was my father that gave your ancestors the manna. He now gives you the true spiritual heavenly bread. God gave you the manna. But now God's giving you something better than manna. See, manna was only a, a symbolic representation of what God can give you. This true bread is sufficient to sustain not only a single nation, but the entire world. Verse 33. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven. The bread only worthy of that name is he... Or rather, is that which cometh down. The bread of God is he. Not manna. He said, in the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven. From heaven, not from the air, but from the highest heavens. And he says, that this bread giveth life unto the world. That, that Not that which preserves a mere human life to one person only. That manna was only good for the person who ate it. Only one person. And it was done. That's all it can do. Because it only has a morsel. But the bread of life, which is Jesus that comes down, is enough for all mankind. For the past and present and future. See, Jesus gives eternal life to anyone who, who is persuaded to take it. Verse 34. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So for this proclamation that Jesus gave them, they said, give us that bread unending then. Verse 35. And our last verse we're going to be covering today says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never, shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. See, Jesus is called the bread of life because he gives life to dead sinners. He takes dead men and makes them living men. Men are in the state, men in the state of nature are dead in trespasses and sins. Whatever they feed on still, on still on the earth still leads to death. Doesn't matter. It says, He that cometh to me shall never hunger. You, hunger for righteousness is what you're not going to hunger for. Because if you need to improve your righteousness as can seen by others, then you partake more bread of life. And you will no longer hunger. If you're hungry for the word of God, you read more of the word of God. And God's righteousness will be revealed in you. So he that cometh to me shall never hunger. You'll never fall short of, of ever again not being satisfied. Because God satisfies our souls through reading and teaching of his word. It says that he that believeth on me shall never thirst. You never thirst for what? The water of life. Remember Jesus is the water of the living water. He told the woman at the well that. If you come to me with, and you, you partake of me, you'll never hunger again. You'll never thirst again. Once you're saved, you're saved. Now, we were talking about what save law, save law, save all people. You know, we're, we are Armenian, and as Armenian, we believe that there's the possibility people can fall into an apostate. So as free will matters, we believe you can be saved once, lost twice. Yeah, that's right. You're not saved by works. You're not kept by works. Works is evidence. Many people proclaim to be saved that are never saved, and therefore they fall away all the time because they're really never saved. I agree with that. That's what my friends who are uh, Calvinists, not, not the hardcore Calvinists, but the independent Baptists, other people like that. I would say same is true for maybe Adrian Rogers and others. Then you have the hardcore people like John MacArthur that believes that if you're ordained to be saved, you're going to save you. If you're not, you're not. Nothing you can do about it. You don't have a choice in the matter. That's not true at all. I don't, I don't understand that, that philosophy. John MacArthur's a great man, but he misses that. I don't understand why. But we as free old Baptists believe that you can be saved one time. And if you choose to reject God anew, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And blaspheme the Holy Spirit, no longer do you have an opportunity. Think, remember, the only way you get saved is the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Because you're a carnal man. You're a sinful person. And the only way you can be saved is for God to enable you to be saved. 
So if you've been saved, you've been able to be saved, and you reject Christ anew, you reject him, you don't, you deny that he's the Savior. You walk away from him. The Holy Spirit will never again come to you. You're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you die in your sins and go to hell. So you can be saved, lost, I mean lost, saved, lost again. The Bible teaches that. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? If we've been partakers of that heavenly gift and let it slip away, it's impossible to renew them again. See, we put them to an open shame. These are scriptures. It's not David. The scriptures. The point is, Jesus tells these men that he that believeth on me, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst again. You trust in Jesus. You lean on him. As long as you trust in him and lean on him, you're eternally secure in Jesus Christ. So that's all we have time for today. I appreciate your time and your attention today. We're going to continue this study on the bread and the wine. It gets more deeper, folks, <laughs> as we get there. But this is the beginning. So please join me next week as we continue to study who is Jesus. Let's close the word of prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I thank you, Lord, for uh, the blessings of reading your word. I thank you, Lord, for your bread and your life. I pray right now, Lord, that you bless it. For the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Again, I thank you for your time and your attention today. And until next time, may God greatly bless you.